Most people who are into computer hardware will have heard of benchmarking tools. They are pieces of software used to assess and compare the performance between different hardware configurations. However, those benchmarking tools are no longer reserved to the PC platform alone. With the increasing processing power of ARM-based smartphones and tablets, it is becoming increasingly popular to run benchmarks on those platforms as well. Up until recently it has been difficult to compare the performance of ARM-based mobile devices with the regular PC components. There have been cross-platform benchmarks in the past, like the well-known Geekbench and 3DMark, but recently there has been an interesting new arrival from the Finnish Basemark company in the form of Basemark GPU 1.2, and it touts itself as being the ultimate graphics performance benchmark and that is a professional evaluation tool to evaluate and compare graphics performance across mobile and desktop platforms. Uniquely, it supports all major graphics APIs and operating systems. And as you can see, all major platforms are supported here. Windows, Linux, macOS, Android 7 and on, and iOS 13. The benchmark is built upon their own rock-solid engine, which, as they say, abstracts resources and rendering, and in this way all platforms run the tests with the same workload. I've always wanted to test myself what the graphics performance capabilities are of modern smartphones. And as I recently got the new iPhone 11 with Apple's latest A13 Bionic chip, I've been really curious to find out just how fast it is. Especially since, well, as usual, Apple has been touting some very impressive performance figures. Basemark GPU works by rendering out a sequence the faster the hardware it runs on, the faster it'll render, and the higher the score it will eventually output. With the help of a few very nice people from Discord, I've compiled the following list of results. Now there's a lot to take in here, so we'll start at the bottom and work our way up. In light blue we have the benchmarked PC GPUs, and in dark blue all the mobile ARM devices. Starting with the Broadwell HD 5500 from my own Dell Latitude laptop which is beaten by the LG G5's Snapdragon A20 and Apple A9 in the iPhone 6S. Moving up we find the Intel HD 520, the iGPU found in Skylake processors. Next around 4000 points are the iPhone 7's A10 Fusion and KB Lake UHD 620 iGPU. At over 5000 points we see the first NVIDIA GPU with the Maxwell A30M found in my latitude. It is beaten by the Snapdragon 845 in the Pixel 3, the Apple A11 in the iPhone X, and Snapdragon 855 in the Pixel 4. Which is very impressive, considering the A30N consumes about 25 watt. Up next, over at 7000 points, we find some classic gaming GPUs. The Fermi GTX 550 Ti, with a 116 watt TDP, and the 188 watt 2GB HD 5870 from my Asus Ares. They are closely matched to the Snapdragon 865 and Exynos 990, found in the new Galaxy S20. And just a bit behind the Fermi GTX 460 and AMD GCN HD 7770. In this case they are however no match for the mighty silicon Apple has been putting in their recent iPhones. The A12 Bionic in the iPhone XS beats the Exynos 990 by 34%, and Apple's latest work with the A13 Bionic is a whopping 58% faster than the Exynos 990, and 17% faster than the A12 Bionic. The performance of the A13 Bionic becomes even more impressive when you look just how close it is with the chips above it, the NVIDIA MX150 and GT130 which are around 10% faster and are both based on the same Pascal GP108 chip and consume about 25 watts of power. So it is extremely impressive to see just how fast the A13 is for being a smartphone chip. Up next we have some older high-end GPUs like the Fermi GTX 570 and TerraScale HD 6970, which are fairly close together at around 16,000 points and both consume well over 200 watts. Now just slightly above those cards, there's the A12X Bionic, found in the latest iPad Pro. And that's interesting for a few reasons. Firstly, just how powerful it is, 
scoring over 47% over the A13 Bionic and being very close with older high-end GPUs. Secondly, in 2018, in an interview with Ars Technica, Apple's Anand Shimpy, who you might know as the founder of Anantech, was keen to point out that the A12X in the new iPad Pro would be comparable performance-wise to the GPU of the Xbox One S. Now we can see how that statement holds up here with this benchmark. The Xbox One S GPU is closely related to the Radeon R7 260. Both are based on the second generation GCN architecture and both have 12 enabled compute units. The closest GPU to the R7 260 in my test is the Radeon 7790, which is based on the same architecture but with two extra compute units. However, in this test the A12X easily exceeds Anand's promise, delivering over 27% more performance than the 7790, meaning it would be even faster compared to the GPU of the Xbox One S, which, as he said in the interview, is an incredible amount of graphics horsepower for a passively cooled chip in a tablet. Moving up in the chart, we find the Tahiti HD 7870XT and then the Kepler GTX 760 and 670 followed by the all-AMG flagship, the HD 7970GHz. Now expanding the chart, we can see the top scoring GPUs in this test. Firstly, the Polaris RX 570 and RX 580, followed by the Pascal GTX 160, and then way off in the distance, the Turing RTX 2060 and RDNA 5700XT. Leading the chart at nearly 130,000 points, the RTX 2080. Now, I think this has been a quite fascinating opportunity to see how the performance of mobile SoCs compares to PC-grade graphics cards. But here is where I think it gets a bit more interesting, although less clear-cut and accurate than I would ideally like to. And that is about power consumption and performance per watt. Andre Frumusanu from Anantec has done some great work measuring the power draw from many modern smartphones, such as a few in this test. He's used various GFX bench benchmarks to stress devices and measure how much power they draw. I've then taken the average power draw of those tests to get a rough idea of what the average power draw is like. And as you can see here, the devices consume between 4 and 6 watts under load. As for the PC graphics cards, we have the listed TDP rating. And while TDP is not equal to actual power draw, it is usually a decent indication. So now this gives the opportunity to calculate performance per watt, or in this case, amounts of points scored per watt, as we can combine all those scores in the following chart. What is cool is that we can actually very well see the clusters of GPU architectures, with the newer generations of GPUs with smaller process nodes, higher up as the performance per watt score increases. Starting at the bottom, between 42 and 73 points, we have the oldest GPUs in this test, with the AMD TerraScale and NVIDIA Fermi architecture from 2009 and 2010, both on 40 nanometer. Moving up between 112 and 182 points, we find cards from 2012 and 2013, with the first and second generation of AMD GCN architecture and NVIDIA Kepler both on 28 nanometers. Above those, between 204 and 377 points, there are the fourth generation of GCN cards from 2016 and from 2014 the NVIDIA Maxwell chips, here on 14 nanometer for AMD and 28 nanometer for NVIDIA. Moving up to the newest architectures here, between 405 and 594 points, with AMD's RDNA from 2019 on 7 nanometer and Nvidia's Pascal from 2016 on 16 nanometer and Nvidia's Turing from 2018 on 12 nanometer. And now we come to the smartphone SoCs, where the difference in performance per watt compared to PC GPUs is staggering, with all mobile SoCs delivering between double to nearly quadruple the performance per watt compared to the best PC GPU in this test, the Turing RTX 2080. Starting with the Exynos 9820 around 1300 points, the Exynos 990 at 1600 points, 
then the Snapdragon 865, which just about tied with Apple's A12, and just under 2,000 points. And then at the top, the Apple A13 Bionic at 2,184 points. Well, those were all the test results, but before concluding, I do again want to stress the inaccuracies of this test. So first, Anantec, they measured power draw using a different application, whereas I used Basemark and they did uh, GFX Bench. So there are some differences in there, possibly. Also, in this test, I used the power draw of the entire SOC, uh, Anantec measured, so that is CPU plus GPU or as I used, the power of the GPU alone. So to make that fair, we'd also need to include um, CPU power in it. And also, of course, the power draw I took was from the TDP rating, and there's a lot of variables in there as well. Um, for starters, um, the possible optimization differences between the GPU architectures. An older card like this might not be optimized and therefore not be uh, performing as well as it should and therefore drawing less power. So there's still a lot of variables at play and I do want to stress that these aren't very conclusive numbers. However, it did show very well, which I really was quite cool, the um, increase in performance per watt as you went to the more modern GPU architectures with smaller process nodes. So that did check out. What I wanted to show with this video is if you're interested in PC GPUs like this one, the Asus Air is a very cool card, is that if you are interested in them, you should also be interested in the chip work that manufacturers are putting in smartphones nowadays, because it is extremely fascinating just how fast they have become in recent years and also how power efficient they are. So that was the main thing I wanted uh, to leave you with. I hope you have enjoyed this sort of exploratory look and the power and performance per watt of smartphone SOCs and also GPUs. Um, I hope you have enjoyed it. If you have a comment, please leave one below. Uh, if you have enjoyed it, also please leave a like and you can also subscribe to be kept up to date on the future videos uh, I'm going to be putting out. Thank you for watching and bye bye.